Alrighty, welcome to the video for 8.3 and 8.4, bonding theories and polar bonds and molecules. Since there was only, since you really don't have to know all the stuff in 8.3 for the regents, but there's something that I kind of felt we should go into a little bit. I didn't think it devoted an entire homework by itself, so I'm kind of lumping it in with 8.4 polar bonds and molecules only because there's one part from 8.3 which is kind of important to 8 both to 8.4 but you don't really need to know it on its own okay and that thing is vsepper which is valence shell electron pair repulsion i find i find myself in my head thinking of it as vesper even though the you know, Vesper would be V-E-S-P-R, but the separate valence shell electron pair repulsion. And that just means that molecules form shapes so that valence electron pairs will be as far apart from each other as possible. Okay, so like let's say we did H2O, right? You have an oxygen joined to two hydrogens, right? And there's two pairs of electrons. All right. Now, something to always keep in mind is even though we have to kind of draw these on paper or in this case a screen in two dimensions, in reality all of these things are in three dimensions. Okay? So like here, if we look at these, right? You have these electrons here because remember this represents two electrons and this represents two electrons here they only like 90 degrees apart from each other and they really don't want to be that close together right so what really happens is this we have here's our oxygen and we'll draw hydrogen down like this hydrogen down like this okay here we'll imagine this is kind of coming out at us Is that lone electron pair that's one of them and now going back here into the page or into the screen is the other lone electron pair right everything's in three dimension so we're here these were 90 degrees apart <clears throat> here these are if everything was equal they would be about 109 degrees apart but what happens is because of these electron pairs wanting to repel each other, they're actually a little bit further apart than these electrons because these electrons have the positively charged nuclei of the hydrogens. So these are a little further apart and these here are a little closer together. But for right now, we'll just call them, man, they're about 109 degrees apart. Right? as opposed to 90. So it puts them further apart from each other. Uh, another common one is methane, right? Which is CH4. Learn a little more about what this is all about later in the year. Right, C H H H H. And it takes the same kind of shape. Where C hydrogen, hydrogen. It's one coming out at us here. As you guys know, I'm a terrible artist. Another one going back into the page. And once again, these are all from one to one, even this to here, this to here. They're all about 109 degrees apart instead of the 90 that's shown here. Okay? The key important thing to remember is opposites attract, but these like charges repel. And since there's a pair of negatively charged electrons here, they get as far away as possible from one another. Okay, so that this brings us to what's called bond polarity. Right? And so far, we haven't talked about how this works and really how the sharing works. But here now, we're going to talk, a nonpolar covalent bond is a bond where the electrons are shared equally. For example, when we have H2, right? So a hydrogen to a hydrogen. Neither one is more electronegative than the other. 
so they share them equally. The electrons spend as much time around this hydrogen as they do around this hydrogen. Okay, same thing with O2. All of these electrons, right? You got your lone pairs. And ta -da. So these electrons spare as much, spend as much time with this oxygen as they do with this one. And the opposite is a polar covalent bond. The more electronegative, in, in a case where there is a polar bond, the more electronegative atom attracts electrons more strongly and has a slight negative charge. And then the flip side of that is true also. The less electronegative atom has a slight positive charge. So going back to the water that I've been drawing, right? You have oxygen joined to hydrogen, joined to hydrogen. And I'm just going to draw these like so. Remember, one's actually coming out at us. The other one's kind of going into the screen here. But the oxygen is more electronegative. So even though it has all of these, you know, four and these two lone pairs of electrons here, even these electrons, the oxygen keeps them more often than the hydrogen does. Each one of these bonds is said to be polar. Since oxygen is so much more electronegative than hydrogen, it has a stronger pull on these electrons. It's like, you know, when I was a kid, if I had a tug of war with my little brother, I was stronger, I was pulling him towards me. So the electrons spend more time with the oxygen. That makes this end of the oxygen negative, this end of the water molecule negative, and this end of the water molecule positive. Okay? Or more negative and more positive. Okay? The like I've been saying in class, the way I've been drawing water molecules is they're like little magnets, and this is why. Alright? And Water more so than others because of these lone pairs, as well as this bond being called polar, right, is very polar in its molecular properties, let's say. Uh, and we use polar, same thing as on a magnet, right? You have the north and the south pole on a magnet, and magnets will line up if you let them so. Right, the south pole of one magnet will align with the north pole of another, etc., etc., and they stick together. Well, more water molecules stick together like little magnets. All right, so this bond up here is a nonpolar bond. This is a nonpolar bond, and these are nonpolar molecules. This is a polar bond. This is a polar bond, and this is a polar molecule. There's a difference between polar bonds and polar molecules. So we're going to talk about that just a little bit here. In polar molecules, one end of the molecule is slightly negative, the other slightly positive, kind of like the water I just drew. And a molecule with two poles is called a dipole. So our water molecule is a dipole, and there's the positive end and the negative end. So you have the negative dipole and the positive dipole. Uh, it's possible, however, to have polar bonds but a nonpolar molecule. Right? So it's possible to have polar bonds but nonpolar molecule. Right? And I know I say this all the time because it's true. This is really, really important. And it's really important to understand this to understand a lot of the things that are coming up in chemistry. All right, chemistry is like a ladder. If you miss a rung on the ladder, you know, broken rung, you're going to die. So it's really important to get each of these concepts. All right, so polar bond, nonpolar molecule. Well, we have carbon dioxide, for example. Okay? Now, Oxygen is much more electronegative than carbon. So this bond here is a polar bond. The electrons spend a lot more time with this oxygen, making it more negatively charged, than they do with this carbon, making the carbon more positively charged. But the flip side is true over here. These electrons spend more time with this oxygen, making it negatively charged, the carbon is negatively charged, as positively charged. But when we look at the overall molecule, 
It's negative on the ends, positive in the middle. Remember, a polar molecule requires one end of the molecule to be negative, the other end of the molecule to be positive. So carbon dioxide has polar bonds. They're each polar, but the overall molecule is nonpolar. Okay? And the kind of key word, the catchphrase for this happening is symmetry. A symmetrical molecule will always be nonpolar, regardless of the polarity of the bonds. Now, this polarity is going to lead to attractions between molecules, and there's different kinds, and they do very different important things. Uh, when we talked about the ionic bonds, I talked about the attraction between the Na pluses and the Cl minuses as they formed that whole lattice kind of structure where they all stuck together. Right? Those are very, very strong intermolecular forces. When we're dealing here with covalent molecules and dipoles and polarity, they're weaker intermolecular forces, but they are very important. All right, so intermolecular forces. They are the attractive forces between molecules. Okay? And they're weaker than both ionic bonds and covalent bonds. The bonds, you know, like here, H, H. This is a bond. It's much stronger than intermolecular forces. It's easier to take these this water molecule apart from this water molecule because right, these are attracted because the H is plus, the O is minus, somewhat these are attracted to each other. It's easier to break this up than it is to break that up. Okay, so different kinds. There's what's called dipole-dipole and that's the attraction between a positive and negative dipole. So if you have the attraction between positive and negative dipoles. So you have some generic molecule, right? And here, boom, it's got a negative end and a positive end. And they'll just line themselves up. That's a minus, plus to minus, plus to minus, et cetera, et cetera. OK? So dipole, dipole is the attraction between that positive and negative dipole. Now, a special kind of dipole-dipole force is what's called a hydrogen bond. And I put the bond here. And I put bond in quotes because it's not a bond like a real covalent bond. I don't like the fact that they call it hydrogen bond. But it's st the strongest of these intermolecular forces that we're going to talk about. And it's what's used on the regions, is what chemists use all the time, so we kind of have to use it, but I'll pretty much always put it in quotes. Whether it's finger quotes or just, I tell you so many times, there's quotes there that you kind of start to remember. So, hydrogen bond in quotes. And the hydrogen in a polar bond is attracted to an unshared electron pair, which is why the intermolecular forces between water are as strong as they are. Because, don't forget, water... I'm here. H, H. There's these unshared pairs here, which really attract hydrogens from the other water molecules. Etc. Etc. All right. This attraction here is referred to as a hydrogen bond. Like I said, they are the strongest of the intermolecular forces. Okay, the last kind we're going to talk about is called a London dispersion force. We call it an LDF, London dispersion force, or simply dispersion forces. Now, what happens is, in any given point in time, all right, let's go back to our H2, right? This is completely nonpolar. But at any given instant in time, the electrons could be closer to this hydrogen or they could be closer to this hydrogen, right? Like kind of if you're having a catch with somebody and you're throwing the ball at an equal rate and they're each of you have the ball for the same amount of time, 
if we were to take a photograph at any instant, one of you is likely to have the ball, or the ball is likely to be closer to one of you. Same thing here. The electrons are likely to be closer to one hydrogen than the other. So in any given moment, this end could be negative and this end positive, or this end could be negative and this end could be positive. All right. So these are called momentary dipoles. Okay. And what's going to happen is these are going to kind of line them up so their momentary dipoles kind of line up and match. So this would flip around so that when this is positive, this end will be negative and this end will be positive. Same thing for the other hydrogen. When this is positive, the negative will be on this end and this end will be more positive. And it's a very weak force, but it's an important one nonetheless. It's important to understand. Okay, one more. All right, now we're going to talk very quickly about what's called a network solid. And these are very, very strong. And it's a solid where all the atoms are covalently bonded to one another. So unlike uh, metallic bonding where the electrons are all free-flowing, right? here, these electrons, they're actually sharing them. And they link and make this very strong structure. All right? very strong so that melting a network solid is isn't a matter of just pulling forces apart it means breaking all of these or many of these bonds throughout it, it takes a lot of energy giving them a very very high melting point or usually impossible to melt i mean they can be high as you know 3000 degrees celsius and up uh a common example of a network solid is a diamond. The reason why diamond is so strong is because there's all of these bonds everywhere which require a lot of energy to break. All right, that brings us to the end of one of the longer ones that we're going to have. It's all important stuff, though, and I recommend going back and looking over it again if you need to. Write down any questions you may have, and we'll go over it in school. See you then.